This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. Welcome to Discussions at the Roundtable. I'm your host, Noah Balmer. And today I'm excited to welcome Mark Landrum to the show. Mr. Landrum is the Managing Director at Socotech, a testing, inspecting, and certification firm for construction and infrastructure projects, and the owner of James Square Energy Advisors. Uh, he is a process and facilities engineering and project management expert. Mr. Landrum holds a BS in chemical engineering from Texas A&M. Mr. Landrum, thank you so much for joining me here today on Discussions at the round table. Well, thank you for inviting me. Of course. Let's jump into it. You've made a career in engineering, uh, but how did you first become involved in expert witnessing? I went to work for a consulting engineering firm that provides advisory services for uh, developers of, of major projects. And that sort of naturally led once I was working in that area into opportunities to be uh, or serve as an expert witness. Were you seeking out those sorts of opportunities or did it just kind of fall in your lap one day? Uh, the first one um, fell into my, my lap. I wasn't really seeking it, but once um, I got a taste of, of <laughs> that kind of work and I enjoyed it. And so I began looking for more uh, opportunities and and developing relationships with uh, litigators at, at law firms. Tell me a little bit about those first calls. Uh, how does that vetting process go? What are you looking for, and what is the attorney or the attorney's representative looking for? Well, I'm um, a technical expert generally. Sometimes I also provide quantum damages mm -hmm. uh, expertise. But as a technical expert, um, the questions from the attorneys were generally about my experience and expertise on the particular issues that were in dispute in a case. Experts are vetting the attorney as much as they're being vetted by the attorney, right? Uh, so right. what makes that, what makes that uh, first call? And then in general, what makes that relationship work for you? Um, I, I would say sticking to whatever commitments you make in terms of delivering a report or uh, some work product and asked to develop um, and, um, you know, being responsive um, when the attorneys ask you to turn around something rapidly. Like for example, I I received a request last last Friday afternoon that required me to work over the weekend. So sure, uh, the attorneys are often doing that, so they uh, don't hesitate to ask the expert to uh, go above and beyond. Sometimes, how how is uh, time management in your particular niche? Do you have difficulty? Uh, making sure that you have time for your regular work and time for your expert work? Or do you use any specific techniques, any calendaring programs or anything like that to keep track of everything that you've got going on? I, I do maintain a calendar with, with key milestone dates. Um, and uh, at present, I, I generally have uh, as uh, an expert witness as many as eight to 10 cases at a time. And so that calendaring and keeping track of when reports are due or when hearing dates are set isn't is important. But I've been able to manage that in part because of the start and stop nature uh, of the expert witnessing work. Sure. Which is uh, one of the things I didn't realize just how uh, how much uh, it would be that way, uh, how often it's hurry up and wait on some cases. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you had mentioned that you were on a bit of a time crunch from this most, pre the most recent engagement. Uh, does that happen a lot where you need something yesterday, you need to turn in something immediately? And how do you, ha how do you deal with uh, that kind of time pressure? Well, fortunately, I have uh, some members 
uh, of my team that have uh, also have years of experience. And so I can call on them if we get into a crunch um, and, uh, and they're willing and able to assist uh, generally uh, and um, maybe develop um, a document list or a document request that I can then review and add a few thoughts to, and we can get it sent off to the attorneys. Is it, is it typical in your niche for experts and expert witnesses to bring on some of their own team? Um, I, I would say it's fairly common uh, in the energy consulting field or, or technical uh, expert witnessing role um, that uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, the testifying expert may have, uh, as I mentioned, a number of cases that he or she is engaged on at a particular time. And then also, if you receive um, two million pages of documents in a document production, <laughs> it can prove uh, a daunting task for the expert to do the initial review of all of those. And so it's very um, helpful to have um, experienced engineers, in my case, that I can call on, plus by delegating to people that uh, don't have the same billing rate that I do, you can help sure. minimize the cost to the client as well. How, how does the contract work when you're when you're bringing in your own team? We uh, put in our engagement letters, proposed engagement letters at Socotech, a rate schedule for not only myself but also uh, the different levels of personnel within the firm that work in the advisory and dispute resolution area. And we indicate in those uh, engagement letters that we may, as appropriate, call on and delegate certain tasks to others. Um, and in my case, that happens, that could be a full-time employee of Socotech that's on my team. It could be a person in a different office. I'm based out of the Houston office, but I utilize um, engineers and uh, professionals with the skills that I need from many of the offices that Socotech has around the U.S. Or it could be a contract, a 1099 contract, hmm. engineering consultant. And I have several of those that I call on uh, from time to time. On the subject of contracts, while we're talking about that, do you have any specific rules that you like to put in there? In other words, do you like to take a retainer? Do you, uh, you know, operate on an evergreen policy? Do you do project rates? What's your typical billing schedule like? Uh, we do request a retainer, a nominal amount. It's, it's not... Um, uh, very high compared to what the total uh, fee billings could be on a large arbitration or, or, or a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do request that, and then we submit monthly invoices and uh, um, request that they be paid as, as soon as possible. And uh, for those law firms that we uh, have worked with, on a number of occasions and, and receive uh, repeat business from uh, their, they and their clients are typically very good about paying. Um, uh, and we, we try to get the age of our receivables um, in the 60 day or less range. Some uh, types of litigation um, such I've done bankruptcy work, I've done some insurance work where I'm working for uh, a number of insurance companies that have uh, taken a piece of a, a, of a, uh, a coverage limit that a, that a policyholder desired. And uh, you'll find frequently that uh, those um, uh uh, number of days until you get paid may may stretch out longer 
in the, particularly in the bankruptcy, because it has to go through um, approval by a bankruptcy trustee for all the attorney's fees and the, and the expert fees. So is, oh, and the expert fees as well. So, so your pay is contingent on the outcome of the bankruptcy, not necessarily just what's in the contract. Is that accurate? No, I, I, I'm shy away from any work where, where the fees uh, in Socotech does as well, where our fees are contingent. So unlike um, the, the lawyers in some cases that may take on a personal injury case, for example, uh, for the plaintiff on a uh, contingency basis, uh, we get paid our uh, standard hourly rates regardless of the outcome. Right. And in that way, we can uh, remain objective and, uh, and, and professional in the services that we provide. Speaking of remaining professional, how do you stay kind of abreast? You you really work in a broad field. There's a lot of different types of actions and types of expertise that you have. How do you stay on top of it? How do you stay current with everything? Um, on the project management uh, side, I have worked uh, as recently as five years ago um, on a major project in the oil and gas industry where I was the project manager for the engineering procurement construction contractor. Hmm. Happened to be a project in West Texas. And so I managed the effort all the way through the detailed engineering uh, procurement and equipment, fabrication of of, uh, structural steel modules and, and piping and then the construction phase and on through the commissioning and startup. And so that was very valuable experience. Um, And um, it's not only experience I've cited, but uh, I I learned a lot as Mm -hmm. well uh, of what some of the pitfalls can be, some of the ways in which uh, major energy projects can uh, get off track, get behind schedule, uh, costs can increase um, uh, out of control. Uh, and so um, when I'm hired as an expert, it's typically because some of those problems have been encountered. Sure. And uh, having been in the shoes of, of a project manager uh, or a, pr- a project management role for the contractor, um, uh, within recent years has um, been very valuable experience for me and something that the, the attorneys appreciate as well. So staying active in your field is the, is your primary thrust for, for staying um, engaged and informed in your field. Is that right? That's right. And then um, also attending technical conferences hmm. and hearing uh, other, others speak about um, developments in the industry and and uh, uh, what's going on, whether it be in the renewable fuels area or uh, carbon capture and sequestration uh, or um, just um, uh, maintenance issues and problems or, or regulatory compliance, for example. Sure. Let's dig into some of the nuts and bolts of these engagements. Tell me a little bit about the preparation that you go through for, say, depositions and cross-examinations. What do you typically get and what works best for you? What should attorneys be doing with expert witnesses and in particular newer expert witnesses? It helps to have uh, a day or more of preparation with the attorney that will be presenting you for deposition. Hmm. And what's been very helpful for me is for uh, one of the law firm's associates or uh, junior partners to uh, role play uh, and um, uh, and um, uh, ask you questions that you're likely uh, to to receive from the opposing counsel during a deposition, and that 
uh, is very helpful in preparing one for, for the actual deposition. I've heard that uh, depositions can be quite stressful experiences. Is that something that you've, uh, have you been through some marathon depositions? I, I've definitely been through some marathon ones where opposing counsel used all seven or eight hours that he was <laughs> allowed to uh, because he, he, uh, he hoped to wear the expert down uh, by going that long. Um, uh, but I, I, uh, I have uh, developed, um, I would say, uh, uh, not, uh, uh, it's not an experience that I uh, like to have. <laughs> it, it can be stra- stressful, but I, I try to be well prepared and, and then um, just enjoy it, try to keep it pleasant try to keep calm um, and uh, only answer the question you're asked and, and not um, uh, give more information than, than you need to, which is the trade of a, of a good expert. Sure. Uh, have you worked on uh, extensive trial teams? Have you worked on actions where there's a number of different experts and maybe a couple of attorneys and maybe a couple of paralegals? And if so, what is the interaction between everybody? How, how, how does that interplay sort of manifest itself during your engagement? It can be very, um, very enjoyable working with a team. And yes, I've worked with um, several uh, very experienced and, and, and really proficient uh, litigators um, and, and been on cases where there could be three or four other experts on our side. And so I have a scope for my testimony, um, but and, and maybe one or two attorneys that I'm working with on my particular scope, but when it comes to the actual hearing, let's say in a in a AAA uh, or an ICC arbitration, you may have a team of um, uh, twenty people, including uh, the the attorneys and paralegals with the law firm and and the experts, and in some cases. Um, uh, people supporting the experts at, at Socotech would be asked, um, or I would ask if they could join us uh, wherever the seat of the arbitration is and could help in quickly locating documents that I recall that uh, I want to show the attorneys uh, in their preparing for their cross-examination of the other experts. And, and so you end up working very closely over a period of uh, at least a couple of weeks on some of these major arbitration cases. When you talk about arbitration, is there a significant difference in the preparation or the routine of being an expert on some kind of alternative dispute resolution like arbitration compared to a traditional trial, or is it largely the same? It can depend on the experience of the panelists on hmm. the, the arbitration panel. Um, if you have, if it's a construction or post-construction dispute, and one or more of the arbitrators has uh, an engineering or construction background, then on complex technical cases, that can be a help because they um, they understand the the fundamental fundamental engineering principles that you may be describing or or the sequence of events uh, that you're describing in a in a in an equipment failure or something like that, uh, and so. It, it helps to understand the backgrounds of, of the arbitrators. And um, I've, I've had uh, people that served as mentors to me have, have said, you always want to write your reports 
um, at like a fifth grade level um, <laughs> because you're unsure necessarily uh, what the background uh, of the panelists may be. Right. And um, but uh, I think it also helps to have um, good graphics um, as part of your direct testimony. And so that's uh, something I frequently recommend it, on complex technical cases, just to be able to have some animated graphics to, to show um, the arbitrators um, uh, a sequence of events or how a process works, for example. That's, you know, I've heard increasingly so that experts are using uh, demonstratives, in other words, your pictures yes. and, and yeah, uh, models sometimes. Yes. Uh, so it sounds like you like using those and you find them effective. Uh, who typically is in charge of making them? Do you do them yourself or does somebody from the trial team, do you outsource it? Uh, I work um, with processing plants, for example, or as an example, uh, a liquefied natural gas or LNG export facility there will be at the design stage a complete three-dimensional uh, computer-aided design model created of those facilities. And you can, regardless of the design platform or software tool that's used, you can export those into uh, a program, a tool called Navisworks. Uh, which allows uh, someone to download a free viewer and you can uh, navigate through like you're flying above or walking through the three-dimensional model of, of all the piping and equipment and hmm. uh, pipe racks. And so if I want to show the arbitrators or the trier of fact um, uh, for example, the development uh, of that 3D model over time, I can take screenshots and show um, what's called, for example, a 60% design review model that had been exported to Navisworks to a 90% and show uh, what additional piping or cable tray uh, uh, or equipment has been laid in by the designer mm -hmm. um, from one model to the to the, to the next, and that's a very effective uh, demonstrative in many cases to show to the arbitrators, and it's something that that I can do um, uh, with a copy of the Navis Works model if it's. Um, where we're trying to animate uh, a process system or piping system and show the flows, uh, or um, if it's a batch process and you, you, you have different uh, uh, steps in an operation, then uh, either I would go or the trial team would go typically to an outside contractor that has that uh, uh, highly, highly uh, skilled graphics expertise to prepare those, those animations. Sure. Absolutely. Do you also employ demonstratives in your expert witness reports? We do. It, it always helps to have charts uh, and, and um, screenshots from those 3d models or photos that show um, a stage of construction or uh, uh, the inspection of a piece of equipment uh, in the shop uh, prior to delivery to the site. So yes, we try to include uh, uh, those types of uh, those types of figures in the reports and that that's uh, proven to be highly effective too. You've been an expert witness for a while now. Have you noticed any significant differences, be it technology or otherwise, in expert witnessing generally that has changed over the last couple decades, at least? Two things uh, 
uh, immediately come to mind on that question. One is that um, email communications are discoverable <laughs> now. And so from when I first served in an expert witness role to uh, more recently, uh, not only the, the volume of information you have to review because there can be thousands and thousands of relevant emails uh, related to a, a construction project um, that, uh, once again, I need to get some help from someone on my team to go through a lot of those and, and help me identify the ones that uh, are most relevant to cite in a report. So that's, that's been one change. And I would I would say there there has been a trend towards uh, using uh, more specialized experts and hmm. and uh, multiple experts. Uh, so I saw more frequently when I first uh, started as an expert witness that I might be the the only expert witness hired by the side that I. Um, was uh, consulting for or working for. But on these larger multi-billion dollar cases, it's not unusual, um, as I mentioned earlier, to see three, four, five, or six experts on each side that are addressing different issues. With that in mind, is it important that expert witnesses find a niche? I would say yes, and it becomes more important that you understand and work with the attorneys to make sure there's alignment on which experts going to testify about which issues, because I don't want to be stepping on someone else's expert report or conclusions in providing my testimony. Do you have maybe a, a story or two about cases that you've worked on, situations which inform the way that you go about being an expert witness or you found out that you were wrong or you were definitely right about something uh, throughout your career? Uh, one, one case that comes to mind is, was um, an arbitration before a, a three-member panel. And uh, I was the technical expert. There was a scheduled delay expert and a damages expert on the same side that, that I was working on behalf of. And I really thought at the conclusion or during that hearing, I sat in, was asked to sit in on the entire hearing, which lasted, uh, as I recall, maybe seven or eight days. And um, I was working on behalf of the respondent so the claimant put on their case and then, then my client and their attorneys presented their case. And I was convinced at the end of that uh, hearing that our client was going to win on the merits of the mm. case from a technical standpoint. But um, as I've, I've since learned happens uh, in many cases, um, it was the legal precedent under the laws of the state uh, that were governing the contract that really um, were the uh, key relevant um, documents or, or, or precedents uh, is what the, the arbitrators made their ruling on and not so much on, on the technical uh, uh, arguments that I had made. So uh, sometimes you uh, you really don't know at the conclusion of a hearing uh, what rulings are going to be made for that reason. Right. It, it becomes a little bit out of your control. All you can do is be the best expert that you can be and let the chips land where they will. Exactly. That, <laughs> that's a good, a good way of saying it. Um, I, I would say uh, in, in terms of the, the start and stop nature, I'm presently uh, working on a case in which I was engaged in, in uh, 2022. And um, it, 
has taken two years for the parties to get to the stage we are at, which is production of documents. And, and so uh, you, can, you can begin working on a case in, in, in this particular one. Um, I prepared what's called a certificate of merit because the engineering standard of care was uh, at issue mm-hmm. in this dispute. I'm working for the owner of a, a large uh, petrochemical complex, and they've uh, taken their um, EPC, engineering procurement construction contractor, to arbitration. Um, and so uh, it was um, uh, an accelerated period to, to review some documents and issue that certificate. And then we had to wait two years because there were non-parties, including the licensor of the process technology, that agreements had to be worked out with because of the proprietary nature of that technology. Uh, that that licensor didn't want the proprietary know-how to be shared with the experts for the two sides. So it took a lengthy time to get to the point where the licensor was comfortable with their uh, technology being discussed and, and reviewed and, and, uh, uh, and written about in the expert reports. So it can be a very lengthy process. In some of these super long actions, do you at least have sufficient time to be ready to go once the, it does roll back around? Do you know that a decision is being handed down or you're going to be needed pretty soon? Or do you just get a call? We need you tomorrow. Well, the, the parties and the tribunal tribunal in this arbitration case had agreed to uh, a procedural schedule that includes Mm -hmm. a report in mid-February of next year. And that agreement was made some time ago. And uh, I think neither party wants to push it out any farther into the future. And so, whereas we thought earlier this year, we had plenty of time to review the vast number of documents and drawings that are relevant to the case. It's now coming down to, oh, we're only here uh, uh, four short months away, and and we still have a lot of document review and analysis to do. So um, once again, it it helps to have uh, some uh, experienced and uh, knowledgeable team members you can call on when it when it gets to be uh, crunch time like this. Absolutely. Before we wrap up, do you have any last advice for expert witnesses or attorneys working with expert witnesses out there? I think I've, I've had to learn to become comfortable with not knowing all facets of a case. You know, when I began doing this, I, I would think, well, I'm going to know, the attorney's going to share with me uh, all of the developments, and I'm going to know exactly where things stand. But now, uh, maybe I just have a few select issues in my areas of uh, specialty that I'm opining on. And um, you don't know everything <laughs> that's going on in the discussion between the opposing counsel for the two parties. And so as an expert, you, you have to become comfortable with uh, maybe having blinders on in a sense that you're very focused on, on the, not only the documents, but the specific scope of your opinions. And you could be, at the end of the day, you could be a critical witness to the outcome, or it could turn out uh, that um, because of the evidence that's presented, uh, the issues you're uh, opining on are, are maybe not that critical to the outcome. But you, you, as an expert, you have to continue to do your best work, um, regardless of uh, the size of the role that you have on a case. 
sage advice. Mr. Landrum, thank you so much for joining me here today. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. And thank you to our listeners for joining me for another episode of Discussions at the Roundtable. Cheers. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Discussions at Roundtable. Our show notes are available on our website, roundtablegroup.com. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening apps. 